good afternoon to you all. It's my great pleasure to do this introduction today for Father Damien. While preparing this introduction, I was struck by some parallels between Father Damien Makey and a Spiritan that we've heard about many times in our Lieberman Luncheon series, Father Daniel Brotier. Whereas Father Daniel Brotier was French uh, and went to Senegal as a missionary, Father Damien is Senegalese and went to France as a missionary. Interestingly, both uh, Father uh, Brotier and Father Damien were placed in urban parishes with mixed communities of Africans and Europeans. And very much the parallel is when Father Brotier was in Senegal, he was trying to build a united parish uh, that crossed different racial and ethnic divides. And very much so when Father Damien was assigned in Marseille in France, he had that same goal of bringing together diverse communities into one worshiping community. Also, like Father Brotier, he has been thrust into education work. And Father Damien has worked uh, extensively in forming young men to become Spiritans. Currently, Father Damien is our scholar in residence here for the Spiritan Studies program. And he's been taking this year to dig very deep within our Spiritan tradition, the history of our founders, our spirituality, and trying to bring together a comprehensive way to, to bring that to young men who are, tr who are preparing to enter the Spiritan congregation. And it's been a very fruitful year for him and has had a great opportunity to dig into our archives, to dig into our Spiritan uh, studies materials. And from that today, he is going to present on our Lenten series, that which is broken will be made whole, and concentrating on Claude Pollard de Place and his life and how that can be a Lenten message for us. And so it's my great pleasure to welcome Father Damien. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm grateful for Bill to have invited me for this time of sharing with you. I am from French tradition. <clears throat> so it seems that the French people speak sometimes too fast. So if I'm going too fast, you just raise your hands and I'll try to go back to a normal space. We are in this special time of the liturgical year, gathered here in this Africa room, you, staff members of this university, some are of our spirit and conference, and me from France, <coughs> with, entrusted with the task of telling you something <coughs> about our founders and the way they can be an inspiration for us in this time of Lent. This gathering was announced as a Lieberman luncheon. But maybe because of my French spirit of contradiction, I'll speak of somebody else. <laughs> because I think that it is important for us to go back to where it all started. And it started very simply with a young man trying to find a meaning for his own life. And it is the questionings of this developing man, his struggle to put a meaning in what he was living. A man around his 20s, so a young man, who was successful in his life. It is this questioning which will lead 
him across the borders of his own community, of his own place of living, and finally of his own way of seeing life. To stretch out to the encounter of other people. And it is this original setting that initiated what has brought us together here today. Because but for Pula de Plas, none of us would be, would be here today. None of us. Even though he never thought of becoming a founder, he was just trying to live a meaningful life. So I'm calling on Pula de Plas because he is our founder. A founder who never thought of becoming a founder. We often think of founders as people who are really extraordinary. But this, this is only in the stories, in the books. We write one things have been done and passed, and you can reflect again upon them. But in the very beginning, it's just somebody who is trying to, to live out his own life. Most of the time, so <clears throat> founders began as very ordinary people, like any of us, who never realized the potentials hidden in their own lives. And since Pular never thought of becoming a founder, we can recognize now, in the fruitfulness of his life, the work of the Holy Spirit. And if you are all there, here, gathered, it is because the experience of Polar de Place reaches out far beyond the congregation. It touches so many people, men and women, around the world, because it has something to do with our own struggles to find purpose and meaning in our own lives. So I'm going to organize my presentation around three points, as they seem to appear in the timeline of Poulard de Place's life. The first point will be the experience of his limitations and the search for his true desire. How did that happen? The second point will be the relationship and the sharing with the other people he has encountered as the place where he found, discovered, and really expanded his own vocation. And then the last point will be this type of continuing journey with fidelity to be invented every day amid all the hardships of life. So let me start by the first point, the, the search for his true desire. And if I can use the... Is it the first one? Claude de Poulard de Place was a young man born and raised in a rich family that counted on this only son to regain its rank in the nobility. And from early age, his destiny seemed all planned, and all his education was oriented towards his goal. Jesuit college, but there was no, no speaker, and so it started by the Jesuits. Jesuit college, law studies, and he was doing well, pretty well, and he had really a bright future ahead of him. And he had very good friends also. Somebody who will become a founder also, Louis Marie Grignon de Montfort, for instance. And he was committed, somehow, as a young man in his Christian life. But Claude was not that perfect, good guy everybody imagined. He was not shaped at first to become a saint. He was, as he said himself, ambitious. 
He dreamed of greatness, honors, success. Just like every normal human being at that age, like all the students we have here who, have, who, who come for school, they are all dreaming of a life of success in their studies and to, to become men and women very well grounded in life. So he was just somebody who was trying to be successful in life, like any of us, dreaming of success, advancements in his job. But like also some people who sometimes carry the burden, the weight of other people's expectation on them. As I said, he was from a very of, of nobility, and his father was counting on him to regain the prestige of the family. Sometimes we have our own aspirations, but we have also the aspiration of other people weighing on us, and it can become really a burden. It can become a pressure on us. Trying to sort out our own way throughout so many proposals, so many, how would I put it in, in, in English? So many things, expectation on us is always something complicated. So Claude decided one day to, to stop and reflect on this life and on what he wanted to be and on what he wanted to do. So he decided to go for a retreat. He was 22. And he went on a retreat with the Jesuits. And there, something happened. Reflecting on what he has lived, on his way of being a Christian and a young man, something happened. His first very discovery was that everything was given to him. It's important to realize in life what we have received. He realized that everything was really given to him. His family life, the relationships he had with his friends, with the parish priest, all of this seemed to converge into, his, into showing him that he was somebody loved with so many opportunities. But those things, it was not out of his own merit. It were things he just received gratuitously. <clears throat> but at the same time, the fact of discovering that things were given him opened his eyes on what was happening around him. So his eyes started to open <clears throat> not only on himself, but on things around him. And gradually, that experience will start opening its own boundaries. Thinking of his privileged situation, he will think of those in less privileged situations. He will upset all the boundaries then, going to meet other people who are not people of his own rank, and seeing that a relationship was possible with those people. So shifting from convened relationships to other types of relationships, even those who are not appropriate at that time. So reaching out to the things that, and the people who were really different from him. So this is, this is his first retreat that made him shift from a sort of self-centeredness very common at this age, to a sort of freedom from himself, and at the same time, introduce him to the taste 
of the peace and joy of being with Christ. And he could now think of leaving his situation, considering having nothing for essence. The path was demanding, but the experience of God he had at that particular time made him very conscious that his communion with Christ was strong enough for him to believe in his promise of happiness elsewhere than in his own zone of comfort. And his first resolution was to try and be and belong to God only. But at the very beginning of this retreat, the second week of the retreat, while he had not yet decided to, for a specific commitment, he still wrote, I am resolved to walk on the path you will tell me. So he is experimenting another type of relationship, letting things happen from somebody else. Letting somebody else help me see in my life. Letting somebody else direct me in my life. Letting things go. It is part of growth, I think, of the process of growth to allow some other people have a saying in the way I'm trying to organize and to orient my life. And I think it's part of your work here as a staff you know, of this university to help the young guys to find their own ways by just having maybe the right word at the right time or maybe some just a word of encouragement to help them adjust themselves to what they want to be and what they want to do. So these discoveries and dialogues have gradually awakened Claude Poulard de Place to his own freedom through what was com coming to shape as his own desire. And that will help him break the fate that weighed on his shoulders to choose his own path. He is no longer going to live according to the projects his parents had for him. He will start thinking of doing something else. He entered into the desire of becoming a priest, for instance. No longer a lawyer to take over from his father, but then becoming a priest. <coughs> so you see the translation, the changes that took place in him. He will leave his family's project. He will leave also his ambition for success. That one is not yet finished anyway. But then he's still, he's already on the way of leaving his ambition for success. And trying to look at something else that seemed to him more consistent with the will of God for him. And the decision he made during this retreat was not based on fears, on ambition, or defenses, but on himself, on his own desire, and the will of fitting into the project of God. And he will never set back from these decisions. It is a foundational, for me, foundational step in his own life. Even though he didn't know how things will happen later. It was the first foundation. Everything is given to me, so I can myself also give to others, encounter the others, and then we'll see what will happen. But to help him, to help him see clearly what was happening in him, Pular needed, like St. Paul, somebody called Ananias somebody to confide in and to help him assess the experience he was going through. 
and it was the role of the priest accompanying him during that retreat. You know that it is, it is I'm sure it is your, your own experience, it is always better to have someone to share our own questions and concerns. Somebody with whom we can reflect and share on our future. It is important to have somebody with whom we can speak freely about our fears, about our failures, about our hopes. Important to have this here in person with us to help us assess our own experience. And one of the signs indicating that we are on the right path when we are listening to people around us is that transformations are lived in dialogue, in respect, in adherence, rather than in conflict and bitterness. I can, I mean, talk about it because it was the way it happened for me, for instance. I went in a diocesan seminary for the three last years of my how do you call it, high school. And when I finished, it was a very tough time. It has been a very tough time for me. Because there was the diocese waiting for me to enter into the diocesan senior seminary. I, was, I, ha I had also a scholarship to go and study medicine in Canada. And I didn't know the spiritans at all. My knowledge of the spiritans came from an encounter and a, a dialogue with one reverences, an old one anyway, who knew the spiritans when they were in my place. And I think in our sharing, she discovered and she helped me discover that I wanted to be maybe a priest, but rather that I wanted to live this life in a community open to going outside. So I discussed with that one, but then you know the way it is. It, I entered in conflict with the diocese because, well, the, the, the bishop was also was expecting for me to enter the diocese. So I had to really to struggle and to be helped before I could go where I wanted to go. And since I didn't know the spiritans, I had to lose one year, lose in brackets, because I had to live one year, a thousand kilometers from my place with a spiritan to discover what was spiritan life before I was admitted to enter into the formation. But I needed those persons around me to talk to, to discuss, and to try and find my way. And they were important, really, at that very time of my life. So, importance of other people to be there and share with us and help us adjust to what we think is the will of God for us. And to help sometimes ease up the pressures we have on our own lives. The second step will be when Poulard decided to become a priest, he went, into, he went to Paris to study in the Jesuit College. And there something, help, something else happened. Yeah. He started caring for the poor because he met in his experience these poor students who couldn't pay for their own studies to become priests. And he started helping one of them. And this commitment, of course, made him discover the others. And another way of living, the way of living of those people who couldn't care for their own lives. What happened is that not only he helped them, but he became close to those people, very close to them. And he listened to them. And he saw the good those people could and the place they could take in the church. His friend, Grignon de Montfort, was becoming a founder and was inviting him to join him. 
And he will reply to, to him this. Yeah, that's the reply to, to, to Guignon de Montfort. What he discovered is that those people had really riches in them. And what was lacking was just somebody to help them, actualize them. And that will be the, the commitment of his life, trying to put these people together in the same house, the same, on the same roof, and help them go as far as they can go to become committed in the church's life. So you see how, again, borders have been crossed. It was not only helping the poor, but then caring for them, and later on living among them as part of them, listening to them, sharing their the, 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 the concerns, and being a brother to everybody. And that's the way he found it, the first seminary of the Holy Spirit. It was his first step towards the congregation we know today. But this was not enough again. See the way when God take, <laughs> takes us, how do you call it, uh, challenges us and wants to take us somewhere. He has so many ways. So this was a foundation. But it was not enough for him. After that, when you found something, you have to, to conduct it. And he got exhausted because he was doing too much. And he went into another crisis. And there again, there were people to discuss with him, to read out, to read back the life with him, and show him that he was too much how do you call it, close to his, to his own work, and he needed to, to take some distance. And then he will start doing what? Calling people around him to work with him and to share the responsibilities of that foundation. So from founding to share responsibilities. We cannot work alone. If we want uh, work to be successful, we need to collaborate with other people. And that was the way, the first community of Spiketans started. Pull out a class with these collaborators, making a team to help the students succeed in their own lives. And of course it was Time was becoming very difficult for them. And on the winter of uh, 1709, he got sick. At the time when they just bought a new house. And since he was with the poor and having no longer the means he had to, to cure himself, the very day they changed the house, that they entered the new house, it was the day he died. And he was only 30. You can't measure the way it has, he has lived from 22 to 30. Eight years. But eight full years of discovering what was his own way and what was the way of doing with others and coping with others and going across all those, those uh, borders and becoming the one today we are calling our founder. So a short life, maybe, but a journey. A journey of faith. Well, the young man learned how f first to stop and reflect, then how to work with other people, and how to become fruitful in spiritual life. And what looked like a little achievement at the end of his life reached to us today. But it was just a matter of crossing borders, taking little steps in the life of a human being, like any of us, that has brought to life what is gathering us today here. 
And now we can appreciate it as a journey of faith and of foundation. How will I link it with our journey of Lent? That we often consider Lent as a season with so many things to do for our conversion. As if it was a matter of performance to achieve. What if it, what if it was rather a time to make a stop in our ordinary lives that are always busier and to discover the world around us, the people around us, and try to adjust to each other. The way Pular just made with his contemporaries. Stop, consider, adjust to each other. To share our stories and realize that we have been blessed to encounter each other. To share our, the stories and to continue to shape our lives and those of the young guys, young girls and, and, and boys, entrusted to us and help them find a meaning in their own lives. I'm sure that if we take really time, the time of considering things the way they happen to us and happen in the lives of other people, we may, who knows, one day find a founder among us. It's possible. In the way it starts, a founder among us. But the most important is for us to realize that we are part of something that is always wider than us, than any of our boundaries, because it carries along with other people an openness to God's creation that is always larger than our own views, to God's plan that is always larger than our own plans. Pope Paul VI, Paul, Paul VI, I'm speaking French, Pope Paul VI, in his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Nunciandi, affirmed that contemporary man listens more willingly to witnesses than teachers. Or if he listens to teachers, it is because they are witnesses. Today, I think, if you can appreciate the fruitfulness of the choices of Blard de Plas, in which we recognize the work of the Spirit, it is because he has become for us a witness that things can be, happen, can be realized with so little means, provided we decide to open our own boundaries and to reach out to other people. I think it is possible for each and every one of us here in UK, in our places of work, in our relationships. And I pray just that our Lent will be this time for us to discover that there are so many possibilities. If you open our hearts, if we reach across our boundaries, and if we leave the spirit to be ahead of us in all we have to try and realize in this life. So thank you. Thank you. Father Damien asked us to be encouragers. And so nothing encourages the people that you work with and the students that you serve like taking cookies to them. <laughs> and so in kind of a, a reverse of Lenten fasting, please take, take uh, cookies to your students. I'd like to remind you that on Wednesday, March the 27th, we'll be having the second in our Lenten series. We'll be welcoming Sean Coleman from the Counseling and Wellbeing Center. And he's going to be presenting to us... Uh, the transition from brokenness to wholeness, and offering this from his personal and his professional expertise. So that is on Wednesday, March the 27th. We'll be welcoming Sean Coleman. So thank you all again.
enjoy the day, enjoy the sun, and as I've mentioned to a few of you, as you're walking back to your offices, please shout out encouragement to the daffodils that are poking their way up through the soil. Tell them that they can make it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yep.